states are constructed by coupling the octopole phonon to the positive polarity states, then this difference in alignment uh, will be about 3h bar. And in fact, if we plot the values for uh, radon 220 um, of this quantity as a function of rotational frequency, it is indeed about uh, that, that lies about that value. On the other hand, if the nucleus um, with the correlate, octopole correlations are stronger and we have a minimum in non-zero values of beta-3 in the total potential energy surface, then the nucleus can assume a rigid uh, octopole or pear shape. And now if we rotate this system, we would expect to see an interleaved sequence of negative and positive parity states. In that case, uh, the difference in this angular momentum between negative and positive parity will be approaching zero. And that's approximately what we see in the case of radium 224. Okay, now, um, in order, recent years or last uh, more than five years now, we, we've um, been able to, to look at uh, uh, or pursue properties of, of um, octopole nuclei in the radon radium region by accelerating radioactive beams. And that's been available at, at radioactive beam facilities such as uh, Isolde. Now, I won't talk about uh, the solder facility too much because there will be some um, other uh, talks on this topic. I think uh, tomorrow morning, for example, um, uh, there will be a talk by, by Gerda, uh, very early, say British time, I should say. Um, but essentially, they, they briefly, I mean, what, what we've done here, we take radioactive ions, which are produced by bombarding a, a primary target of thorium carbide or, or uranium carbide, and then these ions are uh, extracted, uh, in, in injected into the post accelerator uh, for, uh, after being charged bred. And the post accelerator consists of uh, normal and superconducting accelerated cavities. And then the accelerated ions, which can be accelerated up to say 10 MeV per nucleon, are, uh, can go into a number of beam stations. But one of interest to us is, is minimal. And I think that uh, again, tomorrow morning, uh, Nigel uh, will 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 give a, a full, a better description of of this spectrometer, and what I have here. But uh, just to say that this is the device we're using to detect gamma rays from uh, the excited nuclei. Um, now, um, this is in fact a uh, shows typical spectra we obtain using this uh, setup, and um, in fact here I'd be looking at focusing on the octopole behavior of radon nuclei. And in this case, the, uh, the accelerated radon ions impinge on secondary targets and then they undergo Coulomb excitation. And again, there's um, there'll be a number of talks about Coulomb excitation. But what you can see here is um, the, the gamma rays which come from de-excitation of the positive parity states in the ground state rotational band. And these are excited by E2 excitation, so the strong, strongest excitations we see. Uh, but then in addition to that, um, we see excitations which occur by uh, not, not as strong as E2, but still reasonably strong E3 excitations to the negative parity states, which then decay by E1 transitions to the positive parity states, and these are, are shown here. So this top spectrum uh, is that of uh, radon 222, um, the intermediate, the middle one is of uh, radon 224, and the lowest one in red is, is radon 226. Uh, I should say that um, we, well, 25 years ago, we, we measured the, the properties, uh, the level schemes, rotational properties of radon 222 uh, using a deep and elastic reaction, um, xenon 136 on thorium 232, observed the gamma rays. Um, in the uh, gamma sphere and constructed a decay scheme. And fortunately, it looks like the decay scheme we've published <laughs> is consistent with what we observe here. Um, but the, the other two nuclei, radon-224 and radon-226, are completely unknown uh, prior to, to this work. OK, well, just a, a, a brief mention about how we operated Minibull. I mean, because this is well specific to the experiments I describe here. It turns out this is a very versatile uh, instrument. Um, I mean, Minibull itself consists of eight uh, triple clusters. I mean, triple cluster meaning that there's three uh, 
crystals in, in the same uh, cryostat, in which in each crystal has then got an individual segmentation. More about that later. Now, normally when you uh, run mini ball, you you um, you can run it in so-called add back mode. When if you've got an instant gamma ray in one crystal, if it Compton scatters clusters into the adjacent crystal, you can add the energies together, and that sort of um, puts it effectively uh, makes it one large uh, solid angle detector, and then you have, have eight of these. Now, the problem with that, in, in if you want to do gamma gamma and extract decay schemes, is that there's going to be what's called true high probability of true pileup. And that's sort of illustrated here, where this is a little bit of the decay scheme of radon 222. So you have E2x stations up here, E3x stations to the negative priority states. And then if you uh, um, put a gate on an, uh, 449 kV, now this can be constructed in two ways. It's either the energy of the three minus the two plus, in other words, from, from here to here, or it's the sum of the energies of the two to zero and the four to two, as luck or bad luck would have it. So if you uh, put a gate on the sum, which could happen with reasonable probability, then you may expect to see the 320 kV to 64. And that's in fact what we see uh, in this spectrum here. So that could confuse uh, our decay scheme. Um, so what we actually did was to um, run the crystals individually and then we uh, if there was a constant event between adjacent crystals, then that event uh, is rejected. And that, of course, effectively reduces the solid angle of our detection system uh, by a factor of three or so and reduces the pileup, as you can be seen uh, on the right right hand side. But this transition at 320 has disappeared. And all we see is what you would expect to see, which is the 186 kb transition and the hint of this 162, which is 5 minus 3 minus. Okay, well, this is the end result of doing all that. Um, and uh, the, what this shows is uh, a, uh, the constant spectrum we obtained. And uh, hopefully you're convinced by the fact that we can in fact put gates on transitions in both radon now 224 and radon 226 and see the, the constant spectra. I mean, for example, if I put a gate on the 11 minus to 10 plus, then we see transitions on the 10 to 8, 8 to 6, 6 to 4, 4 to 2, and so on. Well, I won't go through all these details. What, what I really like about this spectrum is it, I mean, it just seems uh, something of realizing an impossible dream decades ago when people floated the ideas of radioactive beams that you can actually take ions at 10 to the 5 per second in this case for radon 224 and 2 times 10 to the 3 the second in the case of radon 226 and actually do uh, gamma gamma uh, spectroscopy. And anyway, from these spectra, we're able to uh, obtain the decay schemes. Um, from what I, sh in fact, what I showed a, a year ago, we've actually enhanced the data sets and we are now able to extract a full decay scheme, not just for radon 224, uh, but for radon 226 as well. And this is the old stuff we we obtained, uh, published in 1997. Um, okay, so having got all these decay schemes, what can you do with them? Well, if you do the plot as I described earlier, look at the difference in angular momentum as a function of rotational frequency um, for um, the n equals 132, 134, 136, 138, 140, and so on. I mean, what's striking, I mean, you can look at these individually, but if you take n equals 134, it's quite clear that radon 220 uh, is very different to uh, radium 222, 224, and 226. And similarly for n equals 136, that radon 222 is quite different to radium 224, 222. It, but also it's clear that the, the black squares, which are the radon isotopes, all seem to be octopole vibrational. Um, so and this is how I've highlighted this. Whereas if you look at the, the, uh, the heavier Z um, isotopes, they are isotopes, I should say, they, they are more consistent with this simple picture of a, a rigid pear shape that, that's rotating. Um, and there's some where the, the jury is, is still out, of course. So that's how we can sort of uh, characterize these nuclei. The, the next step was to um, measure um, BE3s uh, in these systems. And um, 
In fact, we were able to do this uh, for three isotopes uh, in the last few years. Um, that is radon-222, radium-22, sorry, radon-222, radium-222, and radium-228. And um, this follows on from much earlier work we did um, in well, 2012 or earlier, where we looked at radon-220 and radium-224. And what, again, the spectra of what I described earlier, uh, we have the strong um, E2 transitions uh, between the positive parity states and then somewhat weaker are the E1 decays from the octopole states. And this was, these experiments were carried out uh, for two targets for tin and nickel. And um, from that we can obtain by looking at the uh, angular dependence of how, how the intensity varies as a function of, of a particle angle. In other, of, or in other words, if you're uh, looking at the the uh, center of mass scattering angle of the of the radioactive iron on the target. You can, for example, measure the, the recoiling target iron and hence determine the center of mass scattering angle. You can do this for various uh, angular ranges and you can obtain a, a large number of data. I should mention though that again, we had to use Minibull in a somewhat different mode. Uh, one problem with the highest solver, the post accelerator, is that the duty cycle, uh, which arises from the way that the ions are charged bred in the e business electron ion gun um, charge breed of the uh, uh, instrument, that the, the duty factor is very small. I mean, we're typically um, pulsing the beam, uh, which is a half a millisecond uh, in, in width, twice a second, so that the duty factor is effectively one over a thousand. So and that means that the instantaneous rate uh, is very high or can be very high, even for these weak radioactive ions. I mean, this is the average beam intensity is six times 10 to five, two times 10 to five and 10 to the five. Um, so the problem is that if you operate it, even in this individual crystal mode, that the individual rates are such high that you, the, the, the spectra deteriorate. So what we in fact did in this case was to take the individual segments, uh, signals from the, from the second, the six segments. Um, and then we did it in the sort of veto mode again, the adjacent segments. Um, if we saw events in two adjacent segments and that, that was removed. And that effectively gives, of course, divides the, the solid angle by another factor of, of six or so, it reduces the, the, the average rate going into the detector. And, okay, well, I won't, in fact, go into at all any details of, the, um, uh, of how we did the Gaussian analysis. Um, uh, because there are some talks on this topic. <laughs> uh, so again, I, I, I can refer you to, well, uh, Magda is talking with talk, no doubt, about Coulomb excitation and the analysis techniques, Liam, Will, and I think tomorrow morning, Nigel also will talk at some length about Coulomb excitation techniques and, and how to determine matrix elements. So. But in fact, our data is, is all being published, so you, or most of it's been published, so you can, you can look at the details there. But what, what we see is sort of a summary of, of what our measurements show um, is, well, there's two quantities being plotted here. First of all, there's the, the quadrupole moment. And I should say, this is the uh, intrinsic electric quadrupole moment, um, which is just related to the actual matrix element um, by the usual rotational model formula. Of course, this makes no sense, uh, nonsense to do that for lead 208, but we can still have a convenient way of plotting it. But as, as you, uh, of course, go up in, in mass, then this quantity uh, almost linearly increases as you, as you would expect as you go towards mid-shell and you get very large uh, quadrupole deformations um, at uh, mass 240 or so. But we've also been able to extract the intrinsic uh, electric uh, octopole moment, uh, Q3, and that's again deduced in the, exactly the same way. And what we can see is that there is a, a sort of uh, a peak arising in, in this region here, around radium 222, 224, 226. On the other hand, radon 222 um, is, seems to be lower, uh, seems to be more consistent with radon 220, as is radium 228. And these are, well, the radons at least are a nuclei we expect to be octopole uh, vibrational. We can do another step, which is to look at the uh, 
deduce the individual, I've got the formula down here, in, intrinsic moments uh, as a function of initial and final spin, again, using the rotational model formula. And this is done um, for several, four types of transitions here. Now, again, if it was rotate, if you're rotating a, a rigid octopole shape, pear shape, then you would expect these moments to be constant. And of course, as they are for I plus to I plus three minus. But that also, that doesn't, that particular transition doesn't distinguish between um, octopole vibration or, or an octopole deformed system. Well, I think one can see at least that for radium 222, 224, 226, uh, if you quickly look at the color scheme here, are consistent with this picture of a rigid pear shape. Whereas the jury is still out is, um, for radium 228, where some of these values fall well below the rotational model prediction. And even for radial 222, there's a hint. Oh, yeah. And someone's speaking over the microphone. Okay, so very quickly, um, the theory says that is good. Okay, we've got various types of theoretical calculations. And um, what could quickly be summarized is that in, in for all these theories with Stratinsky, with Sachs, and Hartree Fock, Bogolubokoni, or relativistic Hartree Fock, Rubov, the radium is predicted to have a more rigid pear shape than radon. And there are some calculations, uh, which is an archive published recently, which suggest oscillations in some of these intrinsic uh, E3 moments, which I guess we don't fully understand what the origin of these as yet, but no doubt some in the audience can. Finally, um, just a quick word about the, uh, the future prospects. Um, well, I can't give a talk on this topic without reference to uh, atomic EDM measurements. Um, and just to say that uh, it, it's one I suppose, possible motivation for measuring E3s in, in the actinai region is that it's expected that there would be an enhancement of any measurable um, atomic EDM, uh, which will arise from uh, um, a, a, an octopole or pear-shaped nucleus within the atom. And that comes from the, uh, the fact that there's a dependence um, on the atomic EDM through the, the nuclear uh, charge distribution through the so-called shift moment. And the shift moment, in fact, um, has been written in terms of a, a, a two numerator terms and the denominator term. And of course, one important term is the term that depends on, on, um, on CP violation in the nuclear force. And that, um, if there is a CP violation, uh, which is significant, then that would give rise to a measurable uh, atomic EDM. But that would be amplified by an increase in this quantity, which is related to the octopole uh, charge moment. And by this quantity, that becomes very small, which is the energy splitting of the parity doublet in the odd A nucleus. And I mean, to summarize what we've measured so far is that we, we've measured this quantity in radon 220, 222 and um, the, or the radium isotopes, but not in any odd A nuclei, which is of course what this is. And we've measured the energy splitting in radium 223, what we have, and others have measured it in radium 223 and 225, which is about 50 kV. But we know that delta E is much smaller in radium than in radon. So this, any enhancement factor here um, is going to be better for radium than radon. And there are ongoing programs of measurements at, uh, for both radon, odd radon and odd radium. Now, can we measure this quantity? Uh, so in the odd mass nucleus, such as radium-225. And this is a simulation of, um, of what we might expect. We did the same experiment in Miniball. And this actually is uh, the decay scheme for radium-225. And here you can see the parity doublet half plus, half plus and half minus separated by 55 kV. If we plug this into a, 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 a Gaussian calculation and then feed in the response of miniball. This is the spectrum we might expect. And you can see it, it's difficult because the transitions uh, of interest, which are there because of E3 excitations, are all very low in energy. And of course, this is where the efficiency of the device is coming down. Um, and in fact, in reality, life is a lot more complicated because there's many other 
bands and transitions which you'll observe, which would take participate in the Coulomb excitation process, and that would make the analysis uh, quite challenging. And then finally, um, as I'm nearly out of time, just to show that I love this plot, I've shown it many times before, and what this is, is a prediction of, of uh, Louis Robledo and George Birch, done a large number, a decade ago or so, of the expected BE3 values uh, for a whole range of nuclei, not just radons and radiums, but thoriums, uranium, and plutonium. And there, these uh, predictive values are not too bad, quite agree quite well with what we've measured experimentally for radon and radium. But what they predict is that, for example, uranium-228 has got by far the largest E3, uh, by a, a fit, massive 50% enhancement over that in radium. Now that's all very speculative, but now we have the call for proposals for the FRIB facility. And uh, it looks like if one looks at the estimated reaccelerated intensity of uranium-228 uh, in the first mode of operation, which is called PAC-1, that the that predicted intensity of accelerate or reaccelerated intensity is of the order of 10 to the 5. So these experiments, hopefully, are, are just around the corner. So let me close here. And just to summarize that we've seen that pear-shaped nuclei exhibit well-defined behavior electric octopole transitions together with rotational behavior. We've identified three cases in nature which at least seem to have this uh, definite pear shape, radium 222, 224, 226. And then finally, I should thank, um, it's quite a large collaboration, but in particular, uh, Liam, Liam Gaffney, Pietro Spagnoletti, uh, and Marcus Scheck. With that, I close, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Peter. Magnificent data as always, and on time, as always. So thank you, sir. Um, there was a bit of chit chat in the chat. Uh, the question from uh, Vivek uh, asking about what was the reason for not choosing 208 lead as the target for the Kulex experiment. There's a further comment on about that. I don't know if you can see the chat, Peter, but uh, have you got a response there? Yeah, uh, okay. Well, I mean, of course you can use uh, lead 208. Um, one problem is that you have to do a kinematic separation um, of the ions. Otherwise you can't tell the difference between uh, the recoiling uh, target ions and the recoiling beam ions. And by choosing nickel and tin, I, unfortunately I don't have any spectra of that, but you can, you can separate that in the kinematics quite, quite easily. Uh, but if you were to bombard a, a lead target, you wouldn't be able to uh, separate uh, the two ions uh, from, the, from the way we do our kinematic separation using the silicon CD detector. Uh, but yeah, sure. I mean, uh, it'd be a perfectly good choice if, if you, you could do that. And it is used for, for, for uh, well, for, for lighter mass system, for example, in mass 150 region, use a lead, uh, lead target. But in fact, the, the, the ex excitations from the target, the nickel and tin, um, uh, don't bother us. They don't, don't interfere with the low energy transitions we observe. Uh, would time of flight help uh, or uh, that wouldn't? No, uh, well, maybe the only thing that could possibly help is that there is on the drawing board a proposal uh, to to build a, um, a superconducting separator, which is uh, it's like a storage ring, but uh, the ions go in and then come out again. And that may have enough uh, mass, mass resolution, I mean, you need both mass resolution, of course, and also um, uh, efficiency. And, uh, and that could possibly do the trick, but that's a long time. That's some years in the future. We don't have that yet. So, Peter, there's a comment there from Stefan Frauendorf. Oh, about, Stefan. <laughs> I, again, are you able to see the chat or do I need to yeah, repeat I, I it? Can. Oh, hang on a minute. I have to go to Zoom and then go to... Oh, I see. All right. Yeah, so Stefan's asking about okay. the K equals zero assumption. Oh, uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, that, I mean, that, that comes from uh, these, uh, well a lot of systematics, experimental systematics, which is known, of course. Uh, I mean, 
but also uh, it's helped by uh, these old RPA uh, uh, calculations of Peter, uh, was it Vogel, uh, who um, established the, this, you know, how these K bands um, uh, evolve across uh, as a function of going through the, uh, the, 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 the shell. Um, but no, I mean, it, you know, we, we know that, uh, at least experimentally, that the, um, close to the closed shells, that the, uh, the observed vibrational, octobolt vibrational states are, are, are k equals zero. However, I mean, if we move up, if we go to something like radium-228, um, then the higher k bands do come down and they are expected to at least interfere and start talking uh, to the ground state band. Um, and that has actually been observed in terms of E3 uh, behavior uh, in the lanthanide region, you know, and probably accounts for why there's a drop in the E3 scene as you go above something like N equals, um, where are we? N equals 86, 88 or so, uh, sorry, 88, 90, between N equals 88, 90, that the K equals one band does come down in energy. But yeah, I don't know if that satisfies you, Stefan. You're quite free uh, to- Can you hear me? Yes, I can yeah, hear we can, you. Stefan. Yeah, when, when you plot the relative alignment, you see it comes down and that can be understood uh, as an admixture of the two phonon aligned phonon uh, to the ground band, to the um, even spins. And so there is quite a bit of um, change. Uh, so you cannot just uh, say, okay, I take the K equals zero klebsch gordon coefficient and then I derive a Q3. This is simply not right because you see from the energy that the uh, alignment is uh, almost complete. And, and that is, uh, I wonder how much would that make a difference for the Q3? Because oh. you have Q3s that are not axial. Yeah, no, you're talking about, hang on a minute. You're talking about this plot here, right? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I mean, I should say- I mean, the, presum no, the presumption I, I, is it's in K equals zero phonon. No, I completely agree with what you say, Stefan, but I mean, let me just say, actually what we publish, uh, can you see, you know, is, is the matrix, yeah. that's what we measure, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so this thing here is just for convenience. <laughs> oh, right. Just a convenient way of, of plotting these data, that's all. All we're really saying is that, well, if all these values are constant, then that's difficult to explain in terms of a K mixing model or any other model, apart from to say that it's mostly K equals zero. And I think, you know, for these light radium isotopes, um, you do expect it to be mostly a K equals zero. But yeah, this is just a convenience way of plotting the data. Well, yeah, thank you. That isn't that um, in contradiction with the energy spectra, which show clearly that's in K equal, uh, it's in uh, alliance with three units. That, that's my... Well, uh, some of them are, but not, no. I mean, the uh, what we're saying here, oops, let's go back to the plot again. Um, yeah, let's, just, let's go between two, they're well, not very far away, these plots, are they? No, I mean, for, for let's see, for... Oops, for radium, let's take radium 224, uh, 222 rather, or 224, radium, that is, that this line here. I mean, you know, we interpret that as probably being a, a rigid pear shape, and that's what we see uh, in terms of the E3 moments. Now, the one case uh, we've measured, which is uh, uh, radon 222, now that seems to indicate that it's, uh, there's a, a, um, a difference in alignment of, of 3H bar. And again, if you go to, go to the plot, unfortunately, we don't have uh, uh, very good data on, or much data on that. But first, well, this does, I mean, it's going to be the same in both pictures, so it doesn't make any difference. But at least for Rad Radon 222, um, that there is, does seem to be some deviation for the one matrix element, uh, which is, if you like, off diagonal measurement. Um, there's better measurements for the lantern of region lanthanide region. I mean, if you look at, I don't have this plot here, but if you look at a neodymium 148, then um, at least for, 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 where are we? I think for this matrix element and this matrix element, they are both um, 
if you like, um, inconsistent with, with this simple picture. And also for radium 228, you know, we have this value here and this value here, which is inconsistent uh, with a rigid pear shape. And so going back to the plot again, if you look at radium 228, so this is a bit of a long answer to a question. It looks like it, radium 228 at least looks like it behaves like radon 226, that it's octopole vibrational. It's a naive picture, um, but as I said, you know, we are experimentalists measuring energy levels so we can draw this sort of picture. And we, but we are measuring matrix elements, which, okay, you can do whatever you want with a matrix element, but uh, that's So, Peter, yeah. So, hey, Oh, as always, the physics is fascinating, and it's great to hear your voice, Stefan. And, you know, hey, you, you can chat privately in the chat, you know, or, or chat openly, however you want to do it. But let's uh, thank Peter. You can show your appreciation with some clapped hands there. And it's uh, time to move on to the next presentation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's even better. Thank you, everybody. Um, so the next speaker is Maria, and she will talk about experiments to determine the electron capture and beta decay